All right. Okay, I've got a question for all of you today. So uh, I want you to listen up. I want you to honestly ask yourself this question. I'm going to ask you a handful of questions. I want you to honestly think about this, okay? So my first question is, I want you to think, would you have what you have if you had no clue what anyone else had? Think about it. Would you have what you have if you had no clue what anyone else had? Or, or maybe here's another way to think about it. Would you want what you want if you had no clue what anyone else had? The things that you want, would you even want those if you didn't know who had those things? Or, or maybe think of it this way. Think about the money that you may have saved if you didn't know what everyone else had. Or maybe we could take it a step further. Think about what you may have been able to do, what you may have been able to give financially, help other people if you had no clue what anyone else had. See, the problem is, at least for me, a lot of the things I want, I want those things because I've seen other people with them. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, this happened to me, this happened like this past week. I was watching this video and I like saw this thing on it and I go, what, what was that? Like, I need that. Like, I had no clue what it was. Like, I didn't even know. And it wasn't even a main part of the video. I was like, that thing in the background, what, what? And I researched, I kid you not, I wish this wasn't true. I researched for like an hour, like what this thing was because my life now needed it, right? Like, has anybody ever felt that before? You see, I think part of our problem is, is we have this knowledge problem. Our problem is I know too much about what others have. You know what I mean? We live in this world, we live in this culture that like shows us, look at what everyone else has. I mean, this is the way social media is designed. Look at how much fun everyone else is having. Look at all the awesome things that they have. Many, many of the things that we want, many of the things that we have in our life is a result of other people having these things. This is just kind of the way it works. Have you ever done this before? Have you, has this ever happened? That maybe you're, you're fine with your car. And then you get into somebody else's car. Maybe they bought a new car and you get their car. And you're like, what? <laughs> you see like there's a computer in the center and you're like, what? You know, and it smells so new. And you're like, I, my car's awful. My car's dumb, right? You know, or, or maybe have you ever gone to someone's house for dinner and they have a beautiful home and you come back to your house and you're like, my house is so lame, right? Like, look at my lame floors and lame walls, right? You know, and it's like after you see what somebody else has, you just, you, you feel like, I just, I need that. You see, this, this taps into this important idea that of, of, of something called an appetite. See, we have these appetites in life, these things that we want, that we desire. We live in an economy driven by desire, the problem with appetites is appetites are never fully satisfied. But I love my phone until a new phone comes out. Then my phone's dumb, right? Like it's like, has anybody, I swear, I think phone makers do this on purpose. Like all of a sudden your phone starts getting slow when the new one comes out and you're like, see, look how slow it is. I need the new one, right? Your battery starts dying faster. And I swear there's some like guy that's like, all right, dial them back a little bit now that the new one's out, you know? And it's like, we want that. Like for me, everyone's a little different. I like, I love technology. And personally, I'm a Mac, like an Apple fanatic. Anybody else like Apple fans out there? Like, amen, amen. You know what tomorrow is? Tomorrow is the Worldwide Developers Conference for Apple. And I moved a meeting so Steve and I could watch part of it live. Like I am commit, like I am a fanboy's fanboy, right? And I am watching and I don't know what they're gonna announce, but whatever it is, I need it in my life. You know, like I, like that's it. all of us have, and it's just different for everyone. For you, maybe it's not a car or technology, maybe it's clothes or makeup, or you see the vacation that someone else went on, the experience someone else had. All of us have these different appetites, and they're never fully satisfied. We always want more, and many times we want what we want because we see what somebody else has. And this appetite inside of us is insatiable. We're going to be talking about that today in our third week of our series, Guardrails. We're going to talk about some guardrails that we can put in place to kind of watch out and protect us from some of these appetites. So we've been talking about this idea of guardrails for the past couple of weeks. And I want to tell you, this is how we define guardrails. Guardrails are a system designed to keep vehicles from straying into dangerous or off-limits areas, right? Like that's what a guardrail does when you drive. It's to direct and to protect. And this is what we've said, that guardrails, they do two things. They direct and they protect. 
They direct us in a direction that we should go that is safe and that is good. And they protect us from driving off the ledge. They protect us from wrecking our car. And we've talked about we need guardrails on our roads. but We also need guardrails in our lives. Because if we're not careful, if we don't have proper guardrails in place, sometimes we can drive our life off the cliff. And our prayer for this, as we've been doing this series, is that we, w- we hope we would instill in you this kind of standard of behavior. That you would say, I'm going to start living my life this way. And that this standard of, of behavior would eventually become a matter of conscience. That at first, what would be a choice of the will, you know, I'm going to decide, I'm going to build a guardrail here in my life. And eventually, that standard of behavior would become a conscience, a matter of conscience in our hearts. We say, hey, listen, this is, it's more than just a choice. This God is leading me in this way. And last week, Kelly talked about an important place that we need guardrails in our lives. And she talked about having guardrails when it comes to our friendships. Guardrails that protect us and that point us, direct us rather, in the direction of healthy friendships, healthy life-giving friendships. And guardrails that protect us from toxic relationships that could do damage to our heart and to our souls and to our lives. And this week and next week, we're going to talk about probably the two biggest areas where appetite can get the best of us. Probably for the vast majority of us in the room, for the vast majority of humanity, two of the biggest appetites that exist revolve around these two concepts, revolve around sex and money. These are two of the biggest appetites there are. After being a pastor for many years, I've talked to so many people and so many problems that trip people up boil down to one or both of these issues. Now, not everyone is the same. I'm not saying this is universally true, but for most people, for most marriages that struggle, many times it it boils down to these issues. You see, this is something that trips a lot of people up, but I've got a few things working against me. I've got a few things working against me. Not only do I realize this is many people's, these are some appetites in many people's lives that trip them up, these are also the two areas that most people want to stiff arm the New Testament teachings of Jesus in regards to. There's this like natural inclination that as soon as you start talking about this in church, it's like, yeah, 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 Dan, we've heard it before. I don't want to hear it. Like, I'm good. Like, don't preach at me. And there's this natural like defensive posture that we take where we want to stiff arm the New Testament teachings. It's amazing when I talk to people about these things and I start bringing up New Testament teachings that they feel like the church is against sex and the church just wants my money. Right? Like, and the church has kind of earned these reputations. We've come by these honestly. I mean, the church many times is taught in such a way that would lead you to believe these things. The church for far too long has used things like shame to teach people that, oh, sex is dirty and it's bad and it's shameful. And that's not at all what it is in God's eyes. God created sex. It's not this shameful thing. It's not like God was walking around Eden and Adam and Eve were doing their thing. God walks up and he's like, oh my, me, what are you doing? You know, and he's like, unbelievable. He's like, angels, do you see what's happening? And they're like, I don't get that. You know, like, that's not how it happened. Right, like this wasn't something, no, God created this. And this whole idea of the church just wants my money, I know. I've been to churches and felt this way. But here at Icon, this, the understanding these guardrails, especially as it pertains to finances, it's not because we want something from you. It's we genuinely want something for you. We want you to experience freedom. We want you to experience what Jesus talks about when he talks about the issues of money, when he talks about the issues of sex. It's so important, but I get it. I've been to churches that it feels like they just want my money. This is one of the reasons, this isn't the only reason, but this is one of the reasons from day one here at Icon, we've done a reverse offering. I've talked to so many people that are like, I've never seen a church do this ever. Why do you do this? Why we do this is because it's a core value of ours. If we say as a church, we want to lead the way in generosity, then we want to put our money where our mouth is. And say, we want to take care of your needs. And man, if there's somebody in significant need that's a part of Icon, we want to be a part of helping reach, uh, meet that need for them. This is something that's important. This is why in our first year of being a church, we committed to plant another church and gave $30,000 to see another church get planted. This is why we give to missions the way we do. Because we believe we want something f- for you. We want you to understand this. And we want to lead the way. But I've also been to churches that it feels like my arm's getting twisted as they talk about money and giving. I've been, to, I've been in a service where they've said, listen, we're not leaving here until we raise this money. 
which I'm like, Kel, let's hit the door real fast. You know, and like before the doors are locked, we're bursting out. You know, I gotta go to the bathroom. You know, whatever it is to get out, right? And we've been to churches like that, haven't we? So I wonder, have you ever been to a church that honestly, when they talk about money, it feels a little like this? Oh, hello. Recently, there have been some rumors that suggest the church is only after your money. Correcto mundo. Since we've been outed, we figured we'd let you in on some things we've been keeping under wraps for a while. Ever wonder why our greeters are so excited to see you? It's because they're all equipped with New Spring X-ray contacts. Welcome to New Spring! So we can know exactly how much is in those purses of yours. Cha-ching! This is just the beginning, my friends. We love it when you stop by for ownership class. And when we say ownership, we really mean ownership. When it's all over, we'll own your car, your house, your dog Scruffy. Oh, and if you have a firstborn, we'll take that too. In an effort to invest in the next generation, we've created our own cloning center. How else do you think we're gonna reach 100,000? So yes, the church does just want your money. But don't worry, it'll be safe with us. Yeah, you guys have felt like that before. And you're like, I knew they had something. Well, they're greeting me so friendly like, that's why, you know. And obviously, it's another church that did this video kind of as a parody to kind of make fun of many times how people look at the church. But, but infor- unfortunately, the church has come by this, uh, these two concepts, these beliefs that, you know, the church is against sex and the church just wants your money. They've, they've come by that honestly and unfortunately. Because this is something that Jesus talks a lot about. This is something that Jesus says is a big deal. And you see, today we're actually, we're going to talk about guardrails, but we're not going to talk about you need a guardrail, you need to budget, you need to learn how to save money, you need to learn how to pay off debt. That's, that's not what we're talking about today. In fact, I believe you can be out of debt. I believe that you can have money saved. I believe that you can have a great 401k and according to Jesus, still wreck your life financially. You see, you can be completely out of debt with money in the bank and have driven off the edge financially, according to Jesus. See, for Jesus, he makes this a matter that's more than just, hey, save up, make sure you're wise. It's bigger than that for Jesus. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to read a teaching that Jesus gives to his followers. This is important because if you're in this room and you're a follower of Jesus, this is a command that he gives you. Jesus is talking to you. And if you're not a follower of Jesus in this room, if you're still unsure about this whole thing, I want you to lean in and listen and at least discover what it means to truly follow Jesus. And for for those of you that grew up in church or that maybe you've been in church for a long time, you've heard this sort of thing before, I want to challenge you not to check out because you'll have this inclination, one, to kind of stiff arm this and go, listen, I don't need this. I don't need to hear this right now. I know someone that needs this, but I'm good. And you'll have this desire to go, oh, I've heard this before. I know where he's going. Dan, yeah, 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 I know where you're going with this. But I want you to listen as if you're hearing this for the very first time. Imagine yourself a follower of Jesus as he begins to teach. And Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. You sit there for us, you see, when this idea of masters, it's, it's hard for us to wrap our heads around. Like, what does it mean to have a master? We don't really have that here in 2018 in America. You might think, oh, no, you don't know my wife. I've got this list and I've got, no, 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 it's, it's different than that. You see, what Jesus was talking about when he says the word master is he means one who's in charge by virtue of possession or ownership. See, Jesus said th- this idea of masters is about someone owning you, something owning you, possessing you. Jesus is making this claim that you can be only possessed by one thing. Only one thing can own your life. Jesus is setting up this dichotomy. And he's going to say, hey, listen, only one thing can own you. And he goes on, he says this. He says, either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. Jesus is saying, listen, your heart can't be divided. You can't be owned by a couple of different things. It's not this 50-50 split. No, no, no. You can only be possessed. You can only be owned, owned by one thing and one thing alone. And in that case, you will love that thing and despise the other. You will be devoted to that thing, and you'll want to throw off the other. So Jesus sets up this dichotomy. And we might be wondering, what's he going to say? The two things that could possess us, you know, is it God or Satan? 
Is it God or the world? You know, you can only serve one thing. And Jesus says this, you cannot serve both God and money. So what Jesus is saying is the greatest thing that will compete for your heart isn't Satan. It isn't this world. It's money. Money, wealth, and possessions will compete for ownership of your heart more than anything else. Jesus is saying, listen up, this is a big deal. And unfortunately, the church has, has taken this and has kind of perverted this teaching and tried to make people feel bad for having things, it, it, making people feel bad for being wealthy. And said things like, oh, the Bible says that you know, money's the root of all evil, and they teach this poverty mindset. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible does say, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. You see, for Jesus, it's not really even about the money. For Jesus, the primary issue as it pertains to money is not money. It's mastery. It's control. It's ownership. Jesus is saying, listen, it, it, it's fine if you own nice things. The problem is when nice things own you. That's the problem. So the question begging to be asked is, do we have money or does money have us? What possesses our heart? What's, what owns our heart? See, and I want to challenge you right now because if you're having this reaction of like, Dan, I'm good, I'm fine, like I've heard this before, yeah, yeah. If what you're wanting to do when you hear things like it's not bad to own nice things is go, see, I'm good. I own some nice things. I'm fine. Dan said it's, it's fine, you know, to own nice things. I'm, I'm good. If your reaction is to immediately justify, if what you want most is justification for your beliefs and your behaviors, you're, you're treading on dangerous ground. So I, I just want to warn you, be careful if when you hear that you go, you breathe a little softer, you're like, oh, I'm good, I'm, I'm fine, Dan said I'm good. If that's your immediate reaction, or to justify why you make the choices you do, if you feel this tension that as I talk about money, you like feel yourself kind of closing up, be cautious. Be cautious of what that might reveal, what God might be speaking to you through this. See, because the problem of ownership the problem that Jesus paints by talking about you can only have one master is when we live this way, when we live in such a way that money is competing for hearts, we don't realize how powerful that is. See, Jesus is making this claim that money and what money promises is the chief competitor for your heart. More than anything else in your life, money will be the chief competitor ownership of your heart. So if this is the case, if this is the claim that Jesus is making, I'd argue this is pretty important. I'd argue that this is, this is a big deal. See, because of this, it, we have to realize that there will be an inclination for us to sidestep the teachings of Jesus. And this is the importance, this is why we need guardrails. Without guardrails in this area, you're either going to drive off the cliff of consumption or wreck your life against the wall of hoarding. You see, this is what I mean by it's not just about budgeting. It's not just about saving. It's not just about being wise. It's bigger than that. It's more important than that. You see, because you can save and you can have your, you know, uh, your safety net and you can have, you know, I've got money and savings and I got a big 401k and you still wreck your life according to Jesus on the side of hoarding. Or you can spend your way into debt and oblivion and wreck your life on the other end. See, the root cause of this, if you look at this, is really this kind of ugly word that we don't like to hear, that we don't like to think in relation to us, and it's this word, greed. Greed is this funny thing. See, because greed is something that oftentimes doesn't see itself. It's like pride. Pride doesn't see itself. Greed, have you ever known anyone that's like, hey, you know, who's greedy? Oh, totally, right here, me, super greedy, right? Like, I'm real greedy. No, no, no one ever thinks that. But you know what we do see in other people? We see this in other people, don't we? We've all known people that, that were like, oh man, that person's kind of greedy. And isn't that interesting that probably all of us could identify at least one person that appears to be greedy, but yet none of us would say that that's true of us. See, it's because this greed many times is hidden in our lives and we can't see it in ourselves. 
So as I was thinking about this this week, I was trying to find a way that I could define it in such a way that might shine some light into our lives and possibly reveal that maybe, just maybe, there's some greed deep in our hearts. So I want to define greed this way. Greed is the assumption that it's all for my consumption. The assumption that it's all for my consumption. That if it lands in my hands, it's for me. That if it's in my paycheck, it's for me. If it's in more my 401k, if it's in my investment portfolio, if it's there, it's there for me. It's just this assumption. This Well, of course, if it's there, it's, it's, it's mine. It's for me and mine. This assumption that we have can reveal the nature of greed in our life. And it can show up in one of two ways. You can consume now, and that's just spending. Or you can consume later, and that's just hoarding. And it's for me and mine. I'm saving for me, for my family. You spend it now, that's just consuming. If you save it for yourself to be able to consume later, that's hoarding. You see, and when we live this way, we're, making, we're actually making a claim about what we believe about God. We're actually living in a way, if you really think about it, if we have this assumption that if it's there, it's for my consumption. When we live that way, we're living as if we don't believe God exists. You see, there's this ancient king of Israel, his name's Solomon, one of the wealthiest kings in, Israel, in all of Israel's history, and he wrote this book called Ecclesiastes. And if you read it, it's, it's a little depressing. Because he keeps saying, it's, everything's meaningless, everything's worthless. And he keeps using this turn of phrase, he keeps saying, everything under the sun. And what he means by that is basically, without God, if God doesn't exist, it's all meaningless. It's all worthless. And he says, you might as well eat, drink, and be merry. Spend all you want, baby, because when you're dead, you're dead, Right? You might as well consume. You might as well spend it. You might think, well, I want to leave a legacy. I want, to, you know, I want people to say good things about me. Who cares? Because guess what? When you're dead, you're dead. There is no God. And those people saying bad things about you, they'll be dead too one day. So without God, you might as well consume. You might as well have an assumption that it's all for your consumption. It's making this claim that God doesn't exist. But the problem is, the problem with that is, is that for all of us that consider ourselves followers of Jesus, and I'd argue even for a lot of people who don't even believe in God, do you know what happens when we hit tough financial times? I mean, when financial times really hit hard, you know what every single one of us do? We pray, right? When the AC goes out and it's 105 in Texas, you better believe, baby, I'm hitting my knees, like Jesus, a technician show up just miraculously, right? Like we are inviting God and God, please help me. And it can be choices that we made. You like spend yourself into oblivion. You're into debt. You got school loans up to your eyes. You got, you know, and they start calling you and all of a sudden, God, I don't know what to do. God, help. Maybe it's choices that somebody else makes. Maybe he leaves, she leaves. Maybe there's a divorce. Maybe you get laid off. And all of a sudden you have this financial problems and you're going, God, what am I going to do now? See, praying in moments like that, when you've lived with the assumption that if it's there, it's for your consumption, and then you pray, what you're saying, you're really making this confession. You're making this confession that says, um, I may have chosen the wrong master. It's this confession of, whoops. Because I lived in such a way that I believed that finances were my provider. I lived in such a way that money was Lord and money would take care of all of my needs, but now all of a the sudden there's a need that my money can't take care of. So my question is, if you are the type of person or you've done it before, financial times have hit, you're inviting God into your finances. If you do that then, why don't you invite him into your finances now? Why not preempt that and choose him as Lord now? See, so there's this question, like, like how do we do that? I mean, what is the guardrail for greed? What protects us and directs us when it comes to greed? The answer is something that may shock you a little bit, and it's reprioritizing. You might think, Dan, what do you mean like, reprior reprioritize what? Reprioritize everything. 
Because here's, let's go back. The definition of greed, greed is this. Greed is the assumption that it's all for my consumption. So what it looks like to be mastered by money is it looks like this. These are priorities. Live, save, give. If it's for my, if it's lands in my hands, this assumption is for my consumption, I'm going to live on that money. Then I might save some money. And then when I'm done, I might give a little bit if there's some leftover. It looks like tipping on Sundays. God, you, you, were, you were good this week. God, thanks for this. I'll just, here's a 20, all right? Like, how about a, you know, how about a Abraham Lincoln? How's that look? You know, and it's just kind of tipping God and like, God, I got a big test this week. So, you know, I don't, I don't know about a hundo, but I'll give you 50, right? You know, and it's just, it's just kind of tipping God. It's, it's after I've lived, after I've saved. And sometimes you can flip those. Sometimes it's wisdom. You're like, I'm going to save a little bit, but it's still saving for me. And then living, and then I'll tip the rest. But what reprioritizing, this guardrail to greed, what this looks like, mastering your money, looks like this. Give, save, then live. It's God, I'm going to give first, declare that you are Lord, that you're my master, that I'm possessed by nothing, I am owned by nothing but you. I'm going to give first to you. Live in such a way that you're going to take care of my needs. You see, giving is the antidote to greed. It's the cure to greed. And when you do this, when you live this way, it's actually doing something for you. At the beginning, I said, I want something for you today. The reason this is important is giving actually gives you independence from a life independent from God. It grants you that independence from from being independent from God. It's saying, God, I want to invite you in now. I'm going to give first and trust you. See, and this is what Jesus talked about as he went on after talking about you can only serve one master. And he goes on, he talks about when we, when money is our Lord, when that's our master, we're looking for how are we, we're worrying, how are we going to take care of this, how are we going to take care of that? And then Jesus says that God is, God is like this, he's like a good father who knows what you need even before you ask. And he'll take care of all of your needs. And then Jesus says this, He ends this teaching with, but seek first the kingdom and its righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus said at the end of the day, if you just do this, if you seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, everything will be taken care of. So it begs this question, like, what is the kingdom of God? What does that look like to seek first his righteousness? And I could could talk about this for hours. But I want to sum this up in in a simple way. God's kingdom is basically, it's an other's first kingdom. For God so loved the world that he gave. God so loved who? God so loved the world. Jesus, on the the last night, on the night he was betrayed, the night he was about to be crucified with his words and with his actions, he he was telling his disciples, he was saying, I want you to watch what I'm about to do. And he said, I'm about to do for the world what I'm about to ask the world to do for one another. He was instituting this new kind of kingdom, this other's first kingdom. Laying your life down for a friend. Caring for the needs of someone else, serving someone else first. you, You have to get this. If you don't get anything else, get this, what I'm about to say. Because I'm telling you, if we grasp what I'm about to say, it could change your marriage. If you really grasp this, if you, if we, if we're all to do this, this could change our nation. This could change our politics. This could change our schools. This could change our community. If we lived in such a way, if we truly believe that selflessness would solve everything. Selflessness will solve everything. Selflessness solve everything. Welcome to the kingdom of God. It's this other's first kingdom. It's understanding I'm not going to be owned by money because money is making these promises that it can't deliver on. Money won't be my master. Only God will be my master. See, some of you need to make a choice today. See, because what I said, you're going to be tempted to kind of stiff arm. You're going to be tempted to go, I don't know. This is for someone else. Like, I don't know if I buy this. If you're a follower of Jesus, Jesus said this is the chief competitor for your heart. And if you haven't made a conscious choice to reprioritize your life, 
You're driving without a guardrail. So set up this guardrail now. Some of you, what you need to do is you need to text the word give to this number. This is how we set up automatic giving here at Icon. My wife and I, we've done this. Because I don't want to be tempted each month to go, ah, man, the kids have some needs, there's some stuff going on, like, ugh, listen to the promises of money. If I just hold on to this, I'll be able to take care of my needs. I don't want to be tempted every month. So before I can even think about it, I want it to be automatic. I want to reprioritize my life in such a way that automatically, God, I'm giving to you first. This is why the Bible, this is why it talks about the tithe. A tithe is 10%. So we just give 10% of everything that God has given us, of our income, we give it back to God. And that's this way that it's this fair and equitable way. 10% for me is the same as 10% for you. Just saying, God, I'm going to return to you this because you're my Lord and I'm going to trust you more than I trust money. The question for all of us is who do we trust more? Do you trust God or do you trust money? Because Jesus said it's one or the other. If we really trust God, then we will reprioritize our life and our life will reflect that. I want to challenge you. If God is speaking to you, if you feel like this is for you today, Take some steps to reprioritize. Hey, for you on the first of the month or first in the 15th, or you set up a way that no matter what, I'm not just tipping God whatever's left. God, I'm going to give to you first. I'm going to trust you to be my provider. Uh, not finances, not money, not stuff. See, how you establish a guardrail to make sure that money doesn't own you as you seek first the kingdom of God with your money. It's easy to say, like, oh, but I help out in kids on Sundays. It doesn't say that our time will be our chief competitor for our hearts. It's a big one. But Jesus said the biggest competitor, it'll be money. It'll be stuff. It'll be seeing what other people have, be seeing what's out there, what's available. That will compete for our heart. So that's where we need guardrails to keep us safe, to direct us and to protect us from wrecking our lives and consumption on one side or the other. So as we close, we're gonna sing here in a moment and it'll be a chance for us to kind of process and maybe make some choices, have some conversations on what we need to do next. But can I pray for you? Let's pray. God, I thank you so much 